Mr. Vice President of the Itaru National Assembly, Mr. Deputy Vice Head of State, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Secretary General, and members of the Itaru National Assembly, Mr. Chief Justice and members of the Supreme Court, members of the Cabinet, Mr. Chairman and members of the Special Military Tribunal, Mr. Chief of Staff and members of the Armed Forces of Liberia, Mr. Grant and members of the Diplomatic Corps, Mr. Chairman and members of the Special Election Commission, Superintendents of Counties, Panama Clan, Chiefs and Elders, Heads of Business Houses, Prelates, Federal Citizens, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen. We are gratified by your kind response to our invitation to assemble in this great cause today. The historic process which we have embarked upon and the mission we undertook five years ago for the liberation and development of this country make us duty bound to invite you here to review the conditions and development in our country. But as we are about to embrace the advent of the new year and to open perhaps the most significant chapter in our power march toward the Second Republic. My fellow citizens, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Almighty God has bestowed many blessings upon us, both as a people and as a nation by his grace we have survived many obstacles we want to thank all of you citizens and friends alike for your efforts prayers and concern in bringing about and maintaining peace and unity in this country After more than 133 years of independence, the system of government in this country has ceased to be a response to the needs and aspirations of the people. Very few people exercise almost absolute rule over the majority of our people. The gap between the government pronouncement and performance increasingly widening. The social contact between the government and the government was rendered meaningless. Thus, by 1980, the national consensus was that a change in the national leadership was necessary and imperative. Consequently, that having determined that all avenues to peaceful change were closed. The men and women of the armed forces of Liberia, under the leadership of 17 gallant non-commissioned officers, overthrew the true party government on April 12, 1980. And the great setback it has brought upon the nation. The trials have begun in the Special Marital Tribunal of the marital personnel involved. Trials of civilian and politicians are to begin in the civilian court as soon as preliminary investigation by the Joint Security are concluded. Considering that the investigation are still continuing, we are not now in the position to make 
final determination of the fate of all those concerned. For we believe that much as we may be inclined to show out of mercy, it is important to exert the due process. Meanwhile, based upon security report and consistent with our desire to sustain the reconciliation process being preached by men and many other citizens, including Bishop George D. Brown and Reverend Peter Emma George, who have decided to order, we have decided to order the immediate release from further detention of the foreign individuals as up to now. We have not received the warrant the official detention. We however request that they remain available to assist with the ongoing investigation if the need arises. One, Sam, Sam E. Matari, Asetobe, Konkola Zaba, Bwama Yabauro, Rufa Mesa, Jim Faya, Tua, Tua Wule, <coughs> Imaya, Kruma, Imaya S. Kruma, Imaya L. Shaw, J. Rudolph Grimes, Eric Atena Brown Shaman, E. H. Brooks, Anne A. Jenkins, and Kwame A. Clement. to rejoin their family and loved ones and continue to make their contribution to the development of our country. In an attempt to address the dislocation which occurred in the economy as a result of the border invasion and to ensure the survival of the country, we have already announced a series of economic measures including redundancy, a retirement scheme of public sector employees. My fellow citizens, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, consistent with our commitment upon assuming power to promote the development of our national economy and improve the welfare of all of our citizens. We have initiated several measures over the years. From 1981 up to now, we have sought to revitalize the economy by encouraging greater foreign investment and instituting such measures as the national saving bond scheme across the board reduction in the salary of public sector employees, factor expenditure control, and the retirement and retrenchment of several seven among others. Regrettably, all of these measures have yielded little results. Additionally, we have observed the millions of these measures, rather than bringing about improvement in the quality of life for our people, are contributing to a decline in the living standard of the people, as well as imposing increasing hardship on them. For indeed, while these measures are being taken, there are thousands of children leaving college, entering the job market. What do we do about all these qualified librarians? What do we do about those to be retired? What do we do about the numerous requests for development and job to travel throughout the country? It is the responsibility of government to create those conditions for creating employment which will enable these young people to become useful and productive citizens. It was in this light that in my speech to the International Assembly and the Labrador people in general on the 5th of this month, I alluded to the fact the other measures which require fundamental changes in our thinking and attitude who have to be researched too. 
in this interdependent world, we have come to realize that no nation can truly develop and prosper in isolation but require the full participation of all people. It is the responsibility of the government and people to determine what could be in the best interest. We have come, we have become increasingly convinced that the place to start is with the land. Our people must develop and grab the re-identification of the concept and system of land tenure in this country. Traditionally, our people have nurtured a strong emotional attachment to the land. It was out of this strong emotional attachment to the land that the founding fathers enshrined in the Constitution of 1847. The provision restricting land ownership to citizens of this country who must be of Negro descent. While this strong emotional attachment to the law, to the land, has been passed on from generation to generation until this day, yet our people have not adequately tapped the land to our national economy benefit and development. Consequently, in the face of our continuing national economic dilemma and the harsh reality of our economic situation, it becomes increasingly imperative to adapt a changing world condition and keep pace with other incommodities of nations, particularly those of the African continent. We must create the atmosphere of free, free to the land to provide for its improvement, for investment and employment, whereby all to benefit. However, we are aware that millions of our people own and have invested extensively in land and real properties, real estate property in other countries, in Europe and the United States, thereby providing employment opportunity for the people in this country. Accordingly, I have been pleased to have received the following communication from the Dissolved People's Redemption Council, data April 26, 1984, which I hereby quote. Mr. Edward the Council acknowledges with thanks your letter data April 25, 1984, PRCV DM2509, slope 1984. Directing, directing that we carefully review your proposal relative to land ownership in Liberia by non-Africans. Mr. Hedda said, land is power and wealth. 